Thank you very much for introducing me uh, two times. And uh, I hope now my presentation works. And I'm sure that the audience in, uh, is anxious to go, uh, anxious to, go uh, to the coffee break. So uh, for the next hour and a half, I will try to share uh, with you our excitement about the protein self-assembly phenomena, uh, focusing on the specific case of the protein self-assembly uh, uh, that leads to the formation of the fibrillar uh, aggregates. So therefore, I will talk about the structural transitions that underpins the evolution of protein nanofibril uh, mechanics. So my group is very exciting about this phenomena for uh, several reasons. First of all, when we are looking at this phenomena, it seems that the biology utilizes many, many mechanisms to regulate this phenomena, uh, whether it's, uh, this phenomena leads to the uh, disease development or to the function con uh, construct. And as you might see from this slide, um, in biology, the protein fibrillation phenomena associated with the two opposed biological roles. On one hand, the formation or transformation of the protein monomers into the supramolecular structures uh, that co generally called amyloids, this is nanoscale fiber, associated with the development of many diseases, uh, more than 60 diseases, among them the neurodegenerative ones. As you can see here, this is the first patient that has been identified with Alzheimer's disease, so this phenomena associated with development of Alzheimer, Parkinson, Huntington, diabetes type 2, and many, many uh, more. And uh, in such case, the prote fibril protein construct have a general name, amyloids. Amyloids usually identified with a, a certain structure. They are rich in beta sheet. They have a cross beta. They have a, a certain diffraction pattern, and they have a certain chemical kinetics. What is interesting that nature utilizes the same, me same mechanism to create the functional constructs. Uh, I wouldn't call them amyloids, I would call them the beta sheet rich fibers. And these beta sheet rich protein fibers have diverse physical properties. As you can see here, silks, whether it's spider silk or silk for warp silks, they are known for their unique uh, mechanical performance that combine uh, elasticity and uh, strength together with biocompatibility and biodegradability. The hogfish slime, highly hydrated substance, which is a mixture uh, of the many components and among them fibril uh, protein constructs that are giving this uh, uh, material properties and extensibility and uh, hydration. Or another type of the um, uh, silk-like uh, silk proteins, which is resiline. In the case of the resiline, the tyrosines uh, or any other entities are cross-linked. And uh, because of this chemical cross-linking, it gives to the material the capability to extend and then to contract, to come back to its shape. And the contractability is usually 100%. So, what is the state of the art in protein uh, fibrillation phenomena or fibril protein self-assembly? We have a uh, we have a lot of information uh, and gather a lot of knowledge over the years regarding the structure, conformation, inter- and intramolecular interaction and function of the monomeric protein unit. We also now able to identify the structure, composition, hierarchy, function, and the physical characteristics of the final construct. What but what happened in the middle is, uh, remains mystery. So basically, what we are asking in our research, what are the key molecular events in this uh, self-assembly process? And what happens if we are introduced the changes in these key, key molecular events, and uh, how these changes affect the final characteristics of the protein uh, constructs? So my group is focusing on the functional materials that are formed from the protein building blocks, and we are eager to understand the fundamental mechanism of protein self-assembly 
and to change these proteins of assembly by utilizing the uh, external uh, fields like a mechanical fields, electrical field, and the combination bet bet um, uh, between them. Uh, and these approaches we are using for uh, playing with the material characteristics and constructing materials which uh, have, a, for example, self-healing properties or thermal uh, conduction, or even uh, to change the rheology of the final state of the material. And we are looking at different land scales of this phenomena, starting from the molecular scale, where we are investigating the protein-protein interaction and how the interaction uh, triggers the conformational transition at the monomeric unit. And the conformational transition and supramolecular assembly we are resolving by using a chemical kinetics. And this work, uh, for, for this work, we are usually collaborating uh, with my ex uh, postdoctoral advisor, Thomas Knowles Lab and uh, uh, Chris Dobson Lab, uh, but Chris Dobson has passed away. Uh, and uh, we are looking at chemical kinetics. At the nano and micro scale, there is a very scientific and interesting phenomena uh, that uh, became a very popular in the uh, past few years that called liquid-liquid phase separation. And in the disease state, as well as the, in the materials um, uh, science, this liquid-liquid phase separation is quite important for a uh, regulation of the conformational transition. So what is liquid-liquid phase separation? Imagine that we have a highly concentrated protein solution and at some point and under certain conditions that can vary from one protein species to another protein species, we have a spontaneous formation of the condensed phase where the protein are sequestered into the vesicle, membrane-less vesicle, and the concentration is so high that uh, this lead to the interaction, basically either con conformational transition from the native fold to the beta sheet read structure. And there is a debate what is going on in these condensed uh, phases, whether it's just liquid-liquid phase separation or it's liquid-liquid crystalline phase uh, transition or phase separation. What is going on there, whether there is only conformational changes or whether it's uh, also the crystallization of the protein. And this process is uh, just uh, uh, happening prior to uh, formation of the fibrillar aggregates. Uh, further, in the material science, these fibril aggregates, especially for the silk, they are aligned uh, with the flow, and uh, this hierarchy and order would dictate what will be the endpoint mechanics, the thermal properties, sometimes even conductivity, and hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity of the material. And today I will focus mostly on this part and only on the one specific example, which is silk worm silk. This work uh, is, um, has been done in collaboration uh, with uh, NEASPEC, with uh, Adrian uh, Chernesov uh, and Andreas Barth uh, group who gave his talk earlier. Silkworm silk is, uh, on one hand, it's widely studied and explored. On the other hand, we still have a vogue understanding about the structural transition and regulatory role of the structure of the protein uh, and uh, its role in the shaping and evolution of the final mechanics. And what is interesting about the silkworm silk that the substrate, the protein itself, is huge. It's about 400 kilodalton. It's uh, considered as unstructured uh, protein that has mostly random coil conformation. And what is unique about this protein, that by changing the environmental condition, we can force this protein adopt three distinct conformation. We can either pr uh, preserve the protein fold. I'm talking about the final state of the materials, whether it's spun fibers or gels or even film. So we are capable either to preserve the native fold during the formation of the material. We can force the same substrate to, to adopt beta sheet rich conformation, and then we will have a highly crystalline material, which is very strong and very stiff. 
And on the other hand, under certain conditions, we can even force uh, this protein to adopt the alpha helical conformation, which is identical to the collagen-like structure. And in this case, we have very extensible material, but not contractible. And when we uh, induce the chemical cross-linking of the tyrosine, we also achieve this 100% of contractability, which means that it's resilient-like uh, behavior. And in nature, this process is highly regulated by the several utilizing the, uh, an ensemble or bucket of the uh, biological and chemical phenomena. And shortly, I will explain how it's happening in the gland. So uh, inside the silkworm silk body, the silkworm silk body consists uh, con um, um, uh, houses stored um, in the two uh, silkworm glands. So basically 90% of the body is two uh, silk glands. And the silk protein is synthesized, stored, and spun uh, from this uh, silk gland. Silk gland is roughly divided into the several regions. The first one, uh, one is the posterior part of the region where the protein synthesis is taking place. So protein monomers are synthesized uh, here, and when the concentration of the protein monomers are reached, reaches its critical level, so we have highly viscous, unstable pulp, there is a mechanism of the protein stabilization. Protein tends to form micron-scale vesicles. How this formation is occurs? Usually by N-terminus to N-terminus dimerization, sequestering the hydrophobic repetitive domains that are rich with GA, GA, GS sequences. And this way, uh, the protein forms the huge vesicles, but the, it preserves its native state, native conformation. Then, uh, when we move to the middle part of the gland, we have these uh, uh, huge vesicles, and suddenly this spontaneous secondary mycelization is taking place. And this secondary uh, mycelization is triggered by the tiny drop in pH and infusion of the metal ions. So we have a formation of the nanoscale vesicles. And our research question was, uh, what is the role of the micron scale vesicles and what is the role of the nanoscale vesicles in the formation and evolution of the silk protein mechanics? And I will, uh, I will explain this in a, in a few seconds. So nanoscale vesicles are subjected to the elongation of flows. They are aligned. They form nanoscale fibers. The fibers are aligned to form and span into the micron scale uh, fiber with a, a programmable mechanics. This is a picture of the silkworm gland. So basically, you can see here all regions, the posterior, the middle, the anterior, and the spinneret. And here is the head of the silkworm where the extrusion is uh, taking place. Uh, we performed quite extensive microscopy study using uh, basically all cryo, all available cryo-based uh, techniques to study the composition of the silkworm gland in vivo, meaning that we wanted to preserve the dynamic processes and we wanted to resolve all these changes, how it's happening under natural conditions inside the gland. And you can see here cryo-SEM image of the of the epithelial cells that are secreting the gum layer of the of the silkworm fiber, and the the fibrin uh, the fibrin uh, protein is stored in the middle part of the gland. And you can see here also the confocal microscopy movie that surprisingly works. I'm very happy about this, uh, where you have you you see the localization of the silk fibrin solution. So uh, we have, as I mentioned, a tiny drop in the pH and acidity is changing during the spinning process, uh, starting from the synthesis to the spinning. And these accompany the transition of the uh, soluble monomers into the solid silk rich fibers. Performing the cryo uh, SCM and cryo TM, and here you see only cryo SCM images, we, we also succeeded to absorb this colloidal protein, the protein that formed the vesicles. And basically inside the gland, close to the posterior part of the gland where the synthesis is taking part, 
We reconfirm all the debates that there is a formation, spontaneous formation of the vesicles, and this vesicle stabilizes or decreases the local viscosity and stabilizes the protein. So as you can see from these images, there is a balance uh, between disordered liquid with a native protein conformation and colloidal protein. So this process is always dynamic. The protein assemble, disassemble, assemble, disassemble into this vesicles. Then when we propagate uh, through the gland, and you can see here also cryo-SCM and STM images, the, there is a phenomena that leads to the, form, the transformation of disordered liquid into the aligned liquid. This is not yet the structural, conforma uh, structural transformation or conformational transition of the protein. It's only the alignment of the of the liquid silk, and uh, this alignment is actually the early stage of the conformational transition and protein-protein interaction. We reconfirm that this, this phenomena is actually relevant also uh, for amyloids, and this has been done in collaboration with the Raffaele Mezenga uh, lab from ETH, where they use the real amyloids and they try to utilize the microfluidic platform the same platform that we are using in the lab to uh, synthetically impose and study this conformational transition and crystallization of the amyloid-related protein. They performed this on vector lactoglobulin and uh, A-beta-40. And they uh, noticed that uh, that similarly to silk, this transition is happening under elongation of flow, but at, at, at the relaxation state. Basically, the fluid is stretched and re relaxed, and un, uh, at the relaxation stage, the uh, structural transition is taking place. Then the line liquid uh, transformed into the line aligned nanofibrils, and here the structural transition from the random coil into the beta sheet read structure is uh, happening, and the line fibrils are um, forming the cross links between them. This make the f silk fiber so strong. And if we compare the natural system, how it's happening inside the gland with the artificial system, the work that has been performed on reconstituted silk fibrin, this step is fundamentally different because the reconstituted fi uh, silk fibrin first uh, uh, form cross links because they are lacking of all protein subunits and there is a two so protein subunits. There is a heavy chain, light chain that link with a single disulfide bridge and there is a decorating P25 uh, peptide and this decoration is actually um, quite important for the cross links, for the formation of the cross links and for the approximation between uh, and dimerization between N terminus and N terminus. I know that it, it's almost the last slide. Uh, so we have a formation of the cross links and then spinning into the bundles that are mediated by the, and this movie doesn't work, by the mus uh, muscle cell. You can see the confocal images where two glands are fused together, the muscles are acting on the fibrin solution, and the fiber is spun, is created. And of course, how without, uh, uh, how we can reconfirm this without nano-IR um, uh, spectroscopy. So we resolve the structural transition between the monomeric state, vesicle-like state, and fibril state, and we see the shift between more uh, structures that are more rich with alpha helical and random coil conformation to, towards the beta sheet upon the fibrillation. And uh, apparently this process is driven by also by the dehydration, and there is a critical uh, volume size in terms of this nanoscale scale vesicles that are aligned in the flow, where this transition is reversible. So basically, we can disintegrate the already formed the beta sheet into the random call because it's incomplete process. But when the dehydration and the shear forces are uh, very, very uh, strong and uh, the solution is almost spun and the volume of, of the co compartments is critical, we have irreversible transition uh, to the uh, beta sheet reads structure that also has been reconfirmed by our collaborator uh, 
uh, uh, Kobe Levy from Weizmann Institute of Science, that the structural transition is taking place like in amyloids on relaxation state, meaning that we took several strands, we stretched them, we relaxed them, and we saw, we observed the formation of the beta sheet. So in summary, the, the process of the silk formation is quite interesting and involves the multi-step phenomena from the phase separation to the phase transition through the alignment of the nanofibrils and finally uh, spinning. And these uh, phenomena, I'm sure, quite interesting for other uh, protein components and also relevant for uh, amyloids, especially liquid-liquid phase separation. And with this, I would like to acknowledge uh, the collaborators that has been contributed to this work, Professor Andreas Bard and uh, uh, his postdoc, uh, Paul uh, Schumann, the staff scientist and the head of the, our AFM unit, Dr. Sidney Cohen, who is uh, uh, sitting here, uh, the group members, especially Dora Elias, who performed this work, and the of course the funding sources. Thank you.